you very much for the introduction, Carl. Uh, thank you for the effort to wake up uh, on the day after the evening when the bar was open till whatever, 11, I think. Uh, I'm very happy to see all of you here. Uh, so yeah, my talk is called, you all can read, can read slides, so I'm not going to read the slides. I'll just move through them forward, and that would be it. Uh, so this is my professional background. I work on all kinds of VMs in my life. Uh, on some of them for longer than six months. Uh, and uh, uh, the first one is a GVM. Probably nobody knows about it, uh, except some people who work on the GVM sometimes. Uh, and then I worked on the V8, which was a JavaScript engine inside the Chrome. And then I worked on the Dart VM. And I worked for some time on LuaJIT. Uh, so and the reason I worked on LuaJIT is because I was working with people who use Torch. And the Torch is like a linear algebra and it's like machine learning framework. Uh, built on top of Lua, and uh, they were interested in pursuing some issues within LuaJIT and uh, fixing crashes and stuff like that, so I was doing that for them. Uh, so don't expect that I'm going to deliver you a deep internal insights into the LuaJIT today, because I'm not the person who implemented LuaJIT to begin with, and probably he will be more well positioned to give this insight. Instead, I will give you an overview of things that I consider being interesting inside the logic that I, when I was reading the source, I uh, thought that these things are interesting. Okay, <coughs> so uh, I just want to check if uh, people know Lua to begin with because it will make uh, some explanations easier. So how many people in the room know Lua, at least a little bit? Okay, it's actually a relatively well-known language. So I will give you a very quick introduction to Lua if, for the people who uh, don't have an experience with it. So the Lua is a dynamically typed language, which is like JavaScript, but a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> depends on whom you ask. Uh, so it has like yeah, dynamic typing. It has uh, like numbers, uh, strings, uh, booleans. It has the table, which is the key value dictionary, and it has closures. Simple. And, and you can see it has a kind of uh, algo-like syntax instead of uh, C-like syntax. So, uh, yeah, the tables are key value dictionaries so where key can be of any type, unlike in JavaScript where key cannot be a string. Uh, so, uh, the syntax like this is just a shorthand for a syntax like this where you have a key with a value x string or y string or a number or even another table can be a key as well. Uh, so, and uh, the, the number type is a single, there is a single numeric type, it's uh, double precision floating points, like in JavaScript. So this is all, all of these values are considered numbers in Lua. Uh, so, and there is a feature called meta tables, which allows you to alter the behavior of tables. So you can set a meta table for a table, and this will change how the indexing operation and the creation of, a, of, a, of a, like assigning a value to an index works. So for example, here I say that the, when you try to get uh, a key from the table, uh, you will print the key and return zero always. And here I say that when you try to put a key, with, you, can, you want to associate the key with a given value, uh, then you will just print this and do nothing else. So if you try to do the, this, you will get printed index some key and then zero because it returns zero. And then if you try to assign some value to 42, it will print new index 42 some value. That, that, that's basically it, it's very trivial. Uh, very simple. And uh, it can also behave like a prototype chain in the JavaScript. If you assign to index instead of a function, you assign a table, then instead of calling it, it will just, if there is no such key in the table, it will look it up on the index table, uh, the index table inside the meta table. So here I assign the table which contains x to, uh, to the index uh, meta method uh, on the meta table for the table. And when I try to look up x, and x is not in the table, it goes to this table and returns 42. So yeah, if you ever wrote any JavaScript, it should be an obvious how this works, or, or small talk also. OK, and uh, meta tables allow you to override things like class <coughs> and stuff like that. So you can, you can basically override all kinds of uh, operators. Uh, that's basically it. So let's return to this simple example here. Uh, after this whirlwind introduction, you will 
it, it should be completely obvious to you that this example is completely meaningless pile of stuff, uh, which I put on the slides simply to illustrate that Lua JIT is a very good JIT. So if you, uh, if you run this example, so what does it do? What does it, do? Uh, it, uh, it creates a table with two keys, like x equals 1 and y equals 1. And then in the loop, it uh, replaces the value of this local variable with another table where the one component is, uh, is moving forward, essentially, and one component is moving backwards. So it's uh, sum. One sum is with uh, plus sign, and one sum is with minus sign. But OK, well, there, is, there should be minus 1 here. It doesn't matter, basically. It's some meaningless stuff. What I wanted to illustrate is that if you look at which kind of code the Luogit generates for this loop, you will be very impressed. And you will go and write some uh, posts in your blog and say this is the best JIT in your life, and you <laughs> will never use any other JIT in your life again. So why this code is good? Uh, uh, how many people can actually read the x86 assembly? Uh, how many people think that they can't read that this is an addition and like this is a subtraction? No, anyway. So it's all uh, mnemonic, so it should be very easy to read. Uh, so. You can see that there is no actual allocation in this loop, right? I was allocating a table here in the loop on every iteration, but this somehow disappeared. And instead, we are operating with the scalar values. So this is a holy grail for many uh, compilers to eliminate the abstractions and uh, do a scalar replacement, essentially. And, uh, and that's why you will write the blog post uh, about Luigi. Uh, and uh, some people, after seeing this kind of well uh, compiled code, they will ask, how does it do it? And they will try to go and learn this by reading the source. And I will tell you that I'm not the kind of person who can learn things by reading the source from the beginning to the end, uh, mostly because it's very hard to find the beginning and end in the pile of C code. Uh, so uh, instead, I uh, do strange <coughs> things to the source. Like here, for example, I add the key to the table, which uh, uh, like I say, this P1 is uh, equals to 1, and then I just uh, thread it through the whole loop iteration. Then I look at what kind of code the logic generates and discover that suddenly there is a whole pile of uh, assembly uh, coming out. Uh, and there is a table allocation here and some GC steps and whatnot. Uh, and uh, I am not very happy person after seeing that, of course. I become like, what? I thought this is the best cheat in the world, and it kind of cope with a small addition. Like, I just the key that gets threaded and nothing <laughs> happening here. Uh, so I like to ask why does it not do something? And learning by fixing bugs, or at least trying to understand why something doesn't work. And I think this is the much better learning technique. And that's how I learned all the things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, because I learned them by looking why something does not work. Uh, so f as an example of things that uh, did not work in Lua JIT, uh, and got fixed not by me, but by the Mike Paul himself, uh, was one gigabyte memory limit. So on the, on the Luajit pre-version uh, 2.1, there was this uh, strange limit uh, on the memory. Like you could only have a, a memory in the lower one gigabyte of an address space, uh, and you could not have more. So why that happened? Well, the, I, as I said before, Lua is dynamically typed, and uh, there are various techniques for implementing dynamic typing. Uh, and uh, what m was chosen for Luajit was NAND tagging. So uh, uh, how many people are familiar with tagging? OK, more people. OK, they're, they're getting more and more people. I think they are reading on the phones while I'm doing the talk. OK, anyway, so, uh, so the, the, this is the double. Uh, this is the floating, double precision floating point number. It's uh, 64 bits in total, and there is some sine bit, and then there is an exponent bit, and the mantissa bits. I, I think everybody should know that from a computer science curriculum. And uh, the observation to make here is that there is uh, the whole family of NANDs, not a number of values, uh, uh, for unclear reasons. Uh, you can have uh, like anything that has the exponent set to the uh, whole bit set, and then the non-zero mantissa that's uh, not a number of values. And usually you need only one, or maybe two, quite and signaling one. But uh, there is much more than that. You can see there are the whole uh, 52 bits that you have to set in the various patterns and use them for your evil purposes. Uh, and uh, yeah. So what Logit does with this observation is that it says, uh, I have the <coughs> t value, which is a dynamically typed slot. and uh, I. It's the size of the double, and if I'm storing the number in it, then it's just stored directly. 
But if I want to store something that is a heap allocated object, then I store the pointer to it in the lower word, and then I put the type tag in the upper word. And then, yeah, that's it. That's the tagging system that Logit uses. And, uh, uh, yeah, for example, to check whether something is a number, you just need to compare the uh, most significant word, the upper word, with, uh, with uh, this magical value here, because that's where the NAND boundary is. And uh, then the table, for example, the, the table tag would be this value. It's just an implementation detail. And the pointer would be in the lower part of the, of the double. And you can kind of see uh, where the, the limit is coming from, right? Uh, you have only 32-bit uh, space here. And I expect at least somebody to say, wait, 32 bits should give you at least four gigabytes, right? If we studied math well in the university. Uh, and the, 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 the reason why it is not the case and why there is a two gigabyte, uh, the, why there is a one gigabyte limit was because on Linux, uh, what's the best way to allocate uh, memory in the lower, uh, lower space, uh, other space? It's to pass the map 32 bit flag to the M map. But it turns out that the Linux people were a little bit lazy when they were implementing it, and they said everybody needs only one gigabyte. So they just allocate, not from the lower 32-bit address space, but from the lower uh, one gigabyte space. So yeah, that's the reason why it is uh, one gigabyte. Also, in some code, JIT-generated code, it would be signed extended. So it's, even if the Linux people are not lazy, you would be, only still be able to use the lower two, megabyte, two gigabytes. OK. So in the 2.1, the tagging scheme was changed. Uh, this part for the pointer was expanded to the 47 bits. And then the tag is only four bits, because that's enough to represent all the types uh, used in the, in the Lua interpreter. And then the upper bits should be all set to one. So as you can see here, you can uh, store a bigger pointers. And uh, that satisfies uh, most connoisseurs, but not the people who actually use uh, like uh, uh, ARM, because uh, the m most modern ARM uh, CPUs uh, expanding the virtual address spaces to a much bigger sizes. Uh, and you will not be able to store this in here. Okay. Uh, and some people might ask, uh, why is it even a tough exercise to change a tagging scheme? It is a tough exercise. Like, I'm pretty sure people like in PyPy would like to experiment with different tagging scheme, even though they don't believe in tagging to begin with. <laughs> you did, okay. But you hidden the results of those experiments. Anyway, yeah, okay, good to know. So, uh, yeah. And that's because uh, this is how interpreting logic looks like. It's uh, uh, 1,000 something uh, lines of assembly code written by hand for each uh, architecture uh, that logic runs on. And uh, you can see it's not a normal assembler, which at least helps a little bit to write it, but uh, it's still an assembler, so it's very hard to fix, uh, to change all the places where the, you have a dependency on your tagging scheme. <coughs> and uh, it's interesting that the assembler that uh, the LuaJIT uses to generate uh, its uh, interpreter is actually the, it's the special assembler that Mike Paul written specifically for LuaJIT in Lua. So uh, there is a Lua script which during the bootstrap parses these files and generates the uh, interpreter. So uh, yeah, so it parses the things and generates the C code, which when compiled and run would uh, generate the binary blob with an interpreter inside. Uh, and this is actually a very interesting thing which uh, I find like, kind of useful because one thing uh, you always have a challenge with when you write the interpreters is that uh, you would like to have certain constants embedded into your code which only C compiler knows. Because you usually write your runtime system in the C or C++, and then you would like to have uh, certain constants there, like for example offsets in the, in the objects. And uh, you either have a choice of parsing the C, C++ code and computing those offsets, or using the compiler for that. And the, here, by generating the uh, C code and then compiling it and uh, emitting the interpreter, uh, we work around because uh, like here we generate this, this snippet gets compiled to some blob of uh, binary data number 10,000 something with these constants like lifted out of it. And then when this C code is run, it just fills the holes in the generated code with those constants from the C side. And here, the, for example, it computes the offset of some fields and just puts it in. Okay. 
so when you write this in the in this assembler, uh, that, that means like an offset of the uh, certain field in a certain structure. Okay. Uh, the, there is still a small problem with this assembler, which I find a little bit uh, concerning, is that it has no actual understanding of types of things that you operate with, which leads to some strange bug bugs <coughs> sometimes. For example, there was a bug uh, which I found where the, when it moved from 32-bit to 64-bit, uh, because the assembler doesn't have understanding of sizes of things, uh, there was a discrepancy. For example, this is a pointer value but uh, uh, this size was not updated when you move to 30, from 32 to 64. As a result, you are comparing the lower part of the point of zero and then doing the decision based on that, which is incorrect. Uh, so it should be actually a different size. It's one letter change, but it leads to very flaky crashes. Uh, okay, so, okay, let's talk a little bit about what's interpreter interpreting. Uh, the, the it's interpreted in a very simple instruction format. It's uh, uh, 32 bits inside each instruction. Uh, there is a lower part, a lower eight bits uh, opcode, and then you either have three operands or two operands. Uh, three operands, eight bit each, or one operand, eight bit each, uh, eight bit, and then 16 bit operand. Very uniform, very easy to iterate, for example, this uh, instruction stream. Uh, and uh, the state of the interpreter looks like this. So you have a base pointer, which uh, can be uh, compared to the frame pointer in the I32 architecture. Uh, and uh, there is a, like a sequence of 64-bit uh, tagged slots. And you can address them from your instructions as registers, essentially. And that's it. That's very simple. So if you have, have an operation that says add 0, 1, 3, it's like add the register number one and register number three and store result in register number zero. Yes, please, go ahead. There are only four registers. What? Uh, how many registers? No, it, it goes to infinity. Oh, okay. To hit there somewhere. <laughs> so uh, eventually it overflows some limits probably, but okay. who knows. But uh, from the encoding, you can kind of deduce that mm -hmm. if you have more than uh, 256, 56 registers, then you're in kind of trouble. And it's actually, if you comp try to compile a Lua program, uh, which has more than 128 uh, local variables, it says, sorry, cannot do that. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of a limit, strange small limits. But I mean, who seriously needs uh, more than 128 local variables? Nobody. Uh, okay, so the interesting instruction is call, because kind of without calls, we can rarely write any useful code. Uh, and uh, the, this is the semantics of the call instruction. Uh, Let's not dig very deep into it, but what it does is it, you, take, you, you specify a register from which to take a function value, and then uh, you just call it with all, with n subsequent registers, essentially. So the, on the stack, on this uh, stack register space, uh, you have the function followed by the arguments, and that's what it does, basically. And then you also specify the number of expected result values because the Lua has the multiple return values, but we will ignore explanation of all these uh, small uh, things with the related to the handling of the multiple return values and stuff like that for brevity. So instead, uh, we'll just say that, yeah, call is you, you take a function and pass everything after the function to the function. Uh, so one interesting thing about this is how simple the call sequence is. So you take the function and you just move the base pointer to here. And now all your arguments are in the first n slots. And that's almost uh, it. So the only thing you need to do is somehow to put an information where to return to, right? Uh, what's the return uh, address? And uh, uh, you do it by linking that to the previous frame and storing some more information. So then the way you link, you say, okay, there is a function stored here. It's a 64-bit uh, slot with the pointer to the function and some type tag which says it's a function. But you know that here you can only have a function. So you don't need these 32 bits. And then you can stash some information there. So then you don't need to move anything around, create any additional space. You just replace the tag of the function on the stack with some additional information which explains how to return. And that's it, you're done. You can proceed executing the body of the function. Yes? Why do you need the pointer still at all? Uh, because you might 
well, if you throw an exception where you are and stuff like that, you, to load things like up values, the values that you are closing on and stuff like that. So it's for very various things. Uh, so, and uh, uh, like here I illustrated how the uh, thing looks like if you're calling the normal Lua function from a normal Lua function. So there are more complicated uh, calling things in the, uh, in the uh, calling combinations in Lua. Uh, but all of them magically fit into this 32-bit encoding because uh, the, the author of the Lua JIT uh, looked at the possible bit patterns and realized that, so the program counters, because all our instructions are 32 bits, they always have the lower two bits zero. Okay, that's good. Now, if we want to encode the different, like usually to return to the previous frame, uh, you need to know uh, how to shift the base pointer backwards. And so we need some delta. And the delta is always 8 byte aligned because all slots are 64-bit. Uh, uh, so, uh, so you have the lower 3 bits available for you. And then you just do the, uh, the dance with figuring out how to use these bits in a way that they don't intersect with each other. And then you could encode the delta and the PC as the upper parts. And the lower parts tell you which type of the return you should execute. And I'm not going to talk about most of this because they're really specific to Lua, but I just find this encoding very uh, tight, very elegant. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I show you how the return to the Lua frame. So here you can see that there is actually no delta encoded. Like you can ask, how do you reconstruct the base pointer? And you reconstruct it by looking at the caller of your, yourself, right? You just look at the return address of the previous instruction of the return address. And it was a call instruction, which says that the base of the call was in this register. So then you just subtract the base of the call, and then you are back to the previous frame. So you don't even need to encode the, the caller frame pointer anywhere. You don't need to store it anywhere. Uh, again, very uh, observant, I would say. Uh, yeah. And there is a very interesting type of frame in the Lua JIT. It's called the continuation frame. And it also uh, surprised me with its elegance, so I would like to uh, talk a little bit about it. So the continuations allow you to specify actions uh, to perform when calling returns. And uh, they are used in various things. Like, for example, uh, if you have a bytecode instruction which compares two values, like if is equal uh, A and D, then you jump to the target. Uh, as I said, there is meta methods in the, in the game here, and uh, you can overload the equality comparison as well. And uh, how would you implement then handling of the meta method? Because you need to, uh, so what if it has an equality meta method? You need to call the meta method, execute, it can be a Lua code as well, then you need to return, and then you need to actually decide whether you need to jump or not jump, depending on the value you returned. So, one potential implementation would be to, you have an interpreter which is stopped here, somewhere inside the implementation of a bytecode is equal. Uh, and then you have a nested interpreter which starts executing the method method. And then when the nested interpreter returns, uh, you will branch on the result of the nested interpreter. And this is kind of complicated because you suddenly have these nested interpreters and stuff like that. Uh, you have to, if you need to traverse the stacks you suddenly need to traverse two stacks in parallel and stuff. It gets really messy. Instead, what you do, uh, you use continuation frames. So uh, some stuff uh, a little bit on the side, but it doesn't <coughs> really matter. So uh, you say, so this is your current frame. And then you put a small chunk of information here, which uh, will be saying when this frame, so this, this will be the frame for the meta method call executing the things. And when this returns, there will be a pointer stored here, which says, uh, basically it's a part of the interpreter, the continuation of the uh, bytecode implementation for equality. Uh, and uh, it will just execute it and do the branch on the target thing. So you, you have the small action here specifying what to do when this returns. And uh, then you don't need to actually have nested interpreters because the, you captured the continuation of the interpreter there. So uh, is this clear or not? Yeah, okay. Uh, it was a rhetoric question. Uh, so, uh, let's talk a little bit about dispatch, and uh, or it should be say despatch or something. I don't know in British English. Uh, so 
uh, and when, when I was giving this talk to my colleagues uh, they, uh, as a dry run, they, some of them became confused because when you say dispatch to the people who work in dynamically typed languages, they immediately think about method calls. And I'm talking more about the interpreter dispatch. So the interpreter dispatch is very simple and like something that you expect from the uh, interpreter. You have a table of uh, handlers for each bytecode in the system and then you just go there. Nothing novel here really. Uh, so, and one observation that anybody in implementing the interpreter should make here is that you can replace handlers and you should be replacing handlers to implement various things like debugging and stuff. So some people come up with completely messy schemes for implementing uh, debugging and things like that, but you cannot just replace the functions you're storing in this table and that's it. Uh, so, and you can even implement profiling using that. You just, from the signal handler or from another thread, you replace the whole table with a, a callback that does record that you had a tick and stuff like this. And it also allows you to do the recording. And the recording is the, is we are slowly getting to the, uh, to the, to the JIT part now. So the, the, the recording is the, is the recording, yes. Anyway, so uh, how many people know how tracing compilers work in the room? Okay, some people know, some don't. Anyway, so you want to discover hot uh, uh, instructions that start your trace, uh, uh, and uh, you want to start collecting, basically recording every bytecode that is being executed after that. So the way uh, Luachit discovers uh, uh, hot instructions, hot like loop headers and hot function entries, is it does hot counting on uh, basically all of these bytecodes that either start the loop or bytecodes that start the function. It has separate bytecodes for this. And the way that hot counting is very interesting. So here is an assembly code, and here is actually how it looks like in C, if I like decompile it to C. So you have a table of some fixed size, which is a power of two, and then you just shift away the bits which are always zero in the program counter, and then you mask it with a table size to create this essentially hash table and then you increment or rather decrement the count in this table and that's, that, that's it. So it actually does not know precise counts for each loop header or each uh, function entry. Instead it matches them all into this table and wh wh once this count reaches zero, it uh, goes into the tracing recording mode. Uh, and the table is rather small actually, it's only 64, bit, uh, 64 entries, which is, I found it very interesting. Uh, it, uh, it leads to non-determinism because depending on how you allocate your bytecodes in the memory, they can clash in the different ways and then you end up optimizing something before something else. And, but it's not all our life non-deterministic, so <laughs> that's not really a big problem, it turns out. Stop. Yes? Can try increasing that? You can try increasing it, yes. And does it have any interesting effects? Uh, uh, it just uh, changes how it optimizes things in the <laughs> order and that's it. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be sooner or later thing, because it stops counting at the instructions that were optimized. So sooner or later, everything that is hot, even if it clashes, will be optimized. Right, yes. right so. Uh, okay, now let's talk about recording. So recording is what starts when you discover that you found a hot uh, loop header or function entry. So I will give a tracing 101 now because Carl said it would be good if you do the tracing 101. So tracing 101 looks like this. Uh, you start with a dot and then you add some underscores to it. No, so uh, uh, th this is the hot... <laughs> uh, it became much clearer now. So you start with the hot instruction and then you start just recording instructions that you see. Sooner or later you arrive to the place where you have branching of some sort. It's uh, maybe based on the condition or it might be just entering some function and you never know if it will be ever the same function if you come there next time. So it is also kind of branchy. And then you always, obviously the execution, we are not writing in some strange non-deterministic uh, uh, programming language where execution can go all directions. The execution always goes one direction when it arrives to this branchy path. So you record that you t took the turn to the uh, right here and then you continue, then you arrive to the next branchy path and then you always just record uh, the path that you actually have taken. And uh, sooner or later, you arrive to the completion of some sort. 
It can be just you looked backwards to the same instruction which you have seen before, or you have uh, like this was a function entry and this is a return from the function. Uh, so, and then you say, okay, I have this trace. Then you linearize it, and then all these paths that you could have taken but not taken, they become guards in your code. Uh, so you say, when you execute this linearized sequence and you arrive to this decision again, then if you, you check the condition, and if it holds, you just proceed forward. And if it does not, then sorry, not sorry, cannot continue, have to go out. So, and, uh, and the thing is, if you, take in, if you are taking one of these side exits, uh, a lot of times you do some counting, and then uh, if you take it enough times, you start tracing from there, and maybe you will look back to here, or maybe you will look somewhere else. And then you have such a maze or spider web of traces, and that's basically tracing 101. Uh, yes. Did this, did this become clear, or this, do I need to do this several times? <laughs> In, well, it's a uh, handmade artisanal animation. Anyway, so uh, did it become clear if you didn't know how tracing works? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I will explain how recording works a little bit in more detail. So you have the interpreter here, and you have the recorder here. And the interpreter has its state in the stack, uh, has its state in the stack, and uh, uh, the recorder has the same, the mirror of the same state, but instead of the concrete values, it stores uh, SSA, re SSA references. Uh, so it's like an abstract state, essentially. And then, uh, uh, when you do something in the interpreter, like here you say, uh, I want to add register 0 and register 1 and store the result in register 0. Uh, then if you have number here, number here, so this is register 0, register 1. And here you have SSA reference number 1, SSA reference number. So, okay, I say SSA, how many people know what SSA is? Okay, good, good, good. It's... Uh, uh, Oh, how is it? No, anyway, <laughs> single, <laughs> static single assignment form. So anyway, uh, it's a form of intermediate representation. Uh, yeah, what I was talking about. Oh, yeah, so you have the SSA uh, value one, SSA value two, in the in these corresponding slots. Uh, then what you do, you say, okay, we are trying to add things. So I would generate the uh, intermediate representation operation, which adds one because it's at one here and two here, which adds one and two, and this will be uh, SSA value three, and I stored it in the register one. And that's it. That basically, I have a yes, please. Uh, the same time, it also always is the addition of the interpreter's value stack, right? Sorry, what again? It, at the same time as doing the recording, it will also always do the addition of the interpreter. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. So what actually happens, you have a hook called before this executes. So it sees the state of the world before executing it, and then once this completes, once it emits it, it returns to interpret, and the interpreter just does what it does, interprets. Uh, okay, and if you have then subtraction, then you do again uh, like the same. You say, okay, I want to subtract constant one from the register one, so I take two from here, then constant one, and I generate the subtraction from the value two, and I store the result in the register one here and here as well. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about IR because uh, IR is a very important part of any compiler. Uh, so the, this is how the trace object looks in a C code. And I know that many people don't like C code, but please bear with me. Uh, you have to like C code if you want to look in the lower sources. sources. Uh, so the, the, this is the IR, and you can see that IR is stored by value here. So this is an array of IR instructions uh, stored in memory by value. So, and there is some magic going on here with this, in this comment which says biased with ref bias. And uh, it might be a little bit cryptic uh, uh, statement, uh, so I will uh, demonstrate what it actually means. So uh, IR instructions, the, the intermediate representation instructions are referenced when you work with them by references, which are just 16-bit numbers, which are indices in this array. But they're not actual real indices. So uh, you say, you, you organize IR in a very interesting way. So that, uh, I, I will just better show you the picture instead of the comment. Uh, you have all non-constant instructions going forward and all constant instructions going backwards. So like in the sense of a butterfly. And your IR array pointer is actually somewhere there in where the queen lives. And uh, uh, you have to add this bias to it to find the middle of this array. 
So uh, this is what the, it's biased with ref bias means, uh, which allows you to quickly check whether the reference is pointing to the IR instruction which is constant or not constant, for example. Uh, yeah, so this is how the IR is organized in memory. And, uh, and the actual, the beginning of an allocated array is somewhere here, and the IR pointer is somewhere even, it's not necessary, so IR0 is not necessary in an allocated memory. Uh, so just some little bit of pointer magic. Okay, so this is how IR instruction looks like. It's a 64, you already heard 64 bit a lot in this talk. So this is again a 64 bit value, and that's it. There is no complicated pointers going backwards and forwards. That's all there is to the IR instruction, 64 bit of information. Uh, and sometimes when field becomes unused at some optimization state, stage, it becomes reused for something else. I will, I will demonstrate it now. So for example, all the IR instructions of the same type, of the same opcode, are linked together uh, using this field here. So that if you need to quickly find all the stores, you just iterate this chain of instructions using this uh, link here. Uh, which allows you to quickly check some preconditions, like if you want to forward store to load, you want to check if there is interfering things. And for that, you just need to iterate IR using these links and stuff like that. Uh, so, or if you want to find the, uh, if you do common sub-expression elimination, you obviously want to find the last uh, emitted operation with the same opcode and look if it matches. You can just check because you, you have the beginning of this stored in some array on the site. So this is a very cool thing. Uh, this link is only used when you actually generate an IR and optimizing it. But when you proceed to generate code in the backend, you no longer need it. So it is actually used for the register locator state. And there, that's the number of the register number, then the stack uh, spill slot number. Uh, then there is a space, 8-bit uh, space for the opcode of the uh, IR instruction and then the type of the of code, of, of, of type of the IR instruction because you can have a load which loads a number or you can have a load which loads an integer or you can have a load which loads uh, something else and then this type specifies what you're actually doing uh, for those instructions where the type matters uh, and uh, and then you have uh, references to the uh, IR instructions which are operands and there's two operand instructions always uh, uh, this can be a constant or immediate. So you can, you can make an interesting observation that you can embed immediates uh, into one of these operands, which is uh, less than the ref bias, because then it will be perceived as a constant in the, in, the, in the IR when doing some operations with it. And also you can see that there is a space to store 32-bit pointer somewhere or 32-bit integer. And you can also see that uh, you can observe uh, if you're really following what's happening here, is that there is no space for 64-bit pointers again. So the IR is not 64-bit ready. So right now somebody is uh, refactoring this whole thing to have uh, space a little bit for the 64-bit values there. Anyway, so yeah. Uh, another interesting thing is that when you work with the IR, uh, you want to pass around the references into the IR. Around and when you pass the references into the IR around, you actually don't pass the 16-bit reference. You add the type of the you load the type of the IR instruction and you store it in the reference itself, which allows you to do some checks without uh, looking into the IR array. So, for example, if you if, when you when you create this reference, uh, you, it can be pointing to the instruction which produces a, a, a number, and you just put this information into the reference itself. Uh, and uh, if you want to check quickly whether this is pointing to the instruction that returns a string or not, you just compare this. Oh, it returns a number. I don't have to do anything. So it helps you to quickly check uh, types of the AR instructions without actually looking at the AR instructions when you do optimizations. Uh, okay, so uh, we kind of want to talk a little bit about this pipeline from bytecode to uh, SSAIR now. So. As I said, you interpret and then you specialize. I haven't said anything about specialization. Then you pipe it through the, some sort of optimizations and then you get your IIR. So we will talk a little bit about this part. We kind of talked a little bit about that part. So uh, this is C code. Uh, this is C code. This is a statement. Uh, so uh, uh, which does the, which produces IR for the len operation, the length operation in the Lua code. So there is a special byte code because there is a special operator to take the lengths. Uh, and what it does is that it asks, okay, is my 
the operation operand is it pointing to a string? And then uh, uh, if it's pointing to a string, I just need to emit the load of a field, f load, uh, from the offset in the string, and that's it. I get the length of the string, right? So that's what it does. It says emit this IR for doing the operation, the field load on this operand and uh, this field. And then there is some stuff. It, maybe it's a table. Then if it's not some compatibility mode, then whatever, emit some special call to a function to compute the table length. Or else record the call to the method method because it should be a method method call. Uh, That's yes. But you, yeah. Should there be a type card or something in the T? Does the T register? No, here it's uh, already all uh, type guarded. So I will talk a little bit about it. So because this is already, so here you ask T ref is true. It means that the type of the value is already a string. Uh -huh. it, the logic very aggressively specializes on types. So there is, if it's, if it's already a string, it means there is already a guard of some sort. Uh, so uh, I will talk a little bit about this later in the amusing part section. Uh, so this emit IR operation here doesn't actually immediately add the instruction to the stream of the instructions in, the, in this array. Uh, <coughs> interestingly enough, it passes it to the fold engine, which Basically, all the IR you emit is going through this sausage factory, which uh, meshes instructions and does all kinds of classical optimizations. And only if it manages to survive until the very end, it gets added to the instruction array. So unlike uh, some other JIT compilers where the recording pipeline just continuously records and then optimizes, the optimizations in lower JIT are right continuously. So, and the fold engine is a gem in its own right. So uh, it's uh, done very interestingly. So you have the C file uh, with some macrosys inside, which say uh, they specify the fold rules. So here, fold rules uh, says if you have a field load uh, opcode with the first operand being the string allocation opcode, and then the second operand being the uh, this uh, field index, which is the length. Uh, field in the in the string, then you apply the this folding function to the instruction, and then there is a preprocessor which uh, finds this parses this file, finds all of these headers and these headers, and builds a hash table w with uh, this being a key and this being a value in this hash table, and then the 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 folding engine is essentially the big fixed point loop which takes uh, the instruction uh, that was passed to it, and then it starts uh, creating keys from it by taking the opcode of instruction and opcodes of the values, meshes them together, uh, looks up if there is a folding rule, applies it. And then the folding rule can either return uh, an existing instruction, or can, it can say stop folding, emit this instruction, and if it doesn't say stop folding, then the folding will continue until the fixed point is reached. If there is no rule that matches concretely, then there is also some wild cards. You can say, if the first operand is this, but the second operand can be anything, apply this folding rule. So it's very nice. Uh, it allows you to, uh, instead of writing this code by hand, which checks all these types, you have some automatic thing that does it. Uh, yeah. And because it's generated ahead of time, you can select the, the hash properties in such a way that you have a nice hash table for look, looks up. For lookups. Uh, so yeah, here the fold is just says if you have a string allocation, then obviously you know the string length. So just return the the, the the part of the instruction that allocates the string that is equal to the string length. That's it. Uh, yeah. So the in the fold engine, uh, fold engine looks as an entry gate that works as an entry gate to uh, uh, different optimizations. So for example, if you have loads and stores the fold engine will uh, pass them to the load, uh, store to load forwarding or load to load forwarding. Uh, then there is a dead store elimination as well there. And then there is a very interesting optimization called uh, narrow, uh, which, uh, so Lua has only the single numeric type. So you would like in some cases to narrow it down to the 32-bit integer. And that's what this optimization is about. Uh, then there is some bound check elimination, and then there is some common sub-expression elimination, which is quite simple because you just look at the opcode and then two 
uh, two operands, you can all mesh it all together and just look up the equal instructions, if it allows the common sub-expression elimination, because some instructions obviously don't allow it. Uh, so once you reach the end of the pipeline, uh, you do some optimizations over the record. So once you finish recording, you reach the end of the trace, you can do some dead code elimination, uh, and you can do the thing. So if you are running on the architecture which doesn't support natively 64-bit values, uh, you do splitting optimization, which is taking 64-bit operations and splitting them into double 32-bit uh, operations. And then there is allocation syncing, which we maybe talk a little bit about later, actually not, but uh, maybe in the couloirs or in the background. Anyway, uh, I would like to talk about the loop thing here. So once you re reach the end of the recording, you would like to create a loop out of your code so that you, when you start executing it, you can just loop inside the trace. Uh, so I will illustrate how this works on this loop here. So you have some sum variable and you iterate some array from uh, one to n and then you sum things together. So uh, yeah, looks pretty simple. Uh, so this is how the bytecode for this loop looks like. So you get the, so this get v is a uh, get value from the table uh, based on the variable index. And then add double v, v is, means add two variables. And then there is a loop bytecode which loops backwards, uh, depending on the state of the iteration, and the, which stored in the three registers, uh, starting from R4. Uh, so the, here's an, like decoding of this into some readable form. So this loop bytecode is the most complicated one. Uh, so you have an index variable, which corresponds to the current uh, iteration. And then there is a step stored in uh, R6, and then there is a limit of the loop which is stored in R5, and then you just do step, compare, and then there is, so actual value that is visible to the user code is a separate register, so you copy it there and then you jump around. So R7 is the I as I stands in the user code, but the actual loop iteration is hidden. Okay, uh, let's now do a little bit of tracing. Uh, so there is a, a small trouble here, so you cannot see due to some uh, size constraints. Okay, the power of the HTML. Uh, so, uh, can you read from the back what this yeah. says? Okay, good. So this is the frame state uh, at, the, at the execution of this code. Now we'll start executing it. So, uh, actual recording looks at the header of the loop first uh, to detect how it started. And then it does some magic uh, with initializing the initial state. Uh, like this is I value, uh, which is, uh, you just load it from the frame, right? So you just, when, when you enter the trace, you would load it from the interpreter state. So that's what it says, load it from the interpreter state. Uh, and then this says load the uh, limit from the interpreter state and do some comparison on the limit. So the reason why Logic does this strange stuff that wasn't anywhere in this code is to uh, check that the limit of the loop iteration is within uh, like 32-bit bounds, then you can do some simpler stuff later with the eliminating bounds check and stuff like that. So let's ignore this magic for now and uh, uh, just say that, uh, let's concentrate on the fact that it just loads the state from the interpreter using this uh, sload stuff. Uh, then uh, you load the current iteration variable because you want to execute the, this operation which uh, gets the uh, value at R7 from the table at R1. So you need to load R1 from the iteration, uh, from the inter interpreter state, which contains the array. And then you just do the load of the, uh, of the size of the table from the, uh, the table. Then you do bounce check using the iteration variable. So you can see it already figured out by looking at the loop. So the loop was from one to n, uh, stepping plus one. And then given this, uh, you can just check the the size, uh, the, 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 the end of the iteration is, uh, is uh, not exceeding the bounds of the array and uh, don't, not, don't do any other bounds checks. Uh, then you load the actual array which contains the, the, the backing storage for the array contents. And then you uh, create the reference into this. Uh, uh, so because it's the, the IR is two operands, you cannot just say, uh, load this from this 
well, you can say, but uh, anyway, so you just create, uh, I confuse myself, uh, you can say that, but you, you have a separate instruction for that, which creates a, a pointer essentially into this array at the given index. Uh, so this was, again, the i, the current iteration. And then you do the load from this address. And this is uh, what you need to do to execute the table get, uh, given the numeric index. And then you need to do an addition on the sum, and uh, uh, yeah, actually the sum should say sum here. You can see that there is a small discrepancy. Uh, you load it, and then you add, and then you store it again here, and then you reach the end of the loop, and that's uh, where you increment the loop counter, and then you check whether the loop counter is still less than a loop limit, uh, loop limit is here, uh, and that's it. That's the end of the trace. So, was it clear? Why need to do this again? I, I, I think there are three repetitions is all usually good enough. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So this is the how the IR after recording looks like. You can see that it, there are actually more things recorded. Like as I said, things are aggressively specialized on type. So here, for example, it says, when I load something from the interpreter state, it must be an integer. If it's not an integer, this is the, will exit. So this, this thing here says this will be a guard which checks something and will exit if it's not. So here it checks that this is an integer still. And uh, this says it should be a table uh, because we are going to load stuff from there. So it's all very aggressively specialized based on types. Uh, uh, and uh, now we would like to create a loop out of this. The thing that you can loop around uh, uh, and then and never exit to the interpreter until the very end. So the way you create this loop is you take the recorded intermediate representation and you start replaying it again through the whole optimization pipeline uh, as if the loop was executed the second iteration. Uh, so, for example, you want to execute Again, this instruction. Now you're basically doing the abstract interpretation. Instead of the bytecode, you interpret in the IR. Uh, so if you want to do the load from the interpreter state, you know that at the end of, the, uh, at the end of this, uh, you had the interpreter state like that. So you just need to find the sixth thing here, and uh, that's it. So it's one. So replaying this, is the same, so you don't need to replay it. You can just reference this instruction. Uh, so then you want to do a comparison. So it's comparison with the one here, but you need to look now here because you replay it. So it's essentially substitution. So here one was substituted with one, which means it's still one. And uh, this comparison is the same as this comparison, obviously, because it has no side effects or anything. So it's the same thing. So now two is substituted with two. Uh, and then the same with the load of the interpreter state at the slot number five. It's just here it changed. It's no longer one, right? So like there you load it and it was one because this is the loop iteration variable. So when you on the second iteration you load it, it must be the one updated on the previous iteration. And the update was here, addition of one to number three. So you say that three on the second iteration is substituted with 12. And then you continue doing that, so the load is obviously the same. You pipe these things through the same folding engine which works when you record normally. And uh, it does the, this, uh, like it sees that there is no interfering stores to this field, so it just can forward it. Then the bounce check is uh, the same. Uh, this is the same. Now you want to create the reference into the array. And one thing did not change, so the 7 is substituted with 7, but 3 is substituted with 12. So it is no longer the same thing. So you need to emit it as a separate instruction, and uh, you continue. The load, again, is the different thing, because here it was referenced in 8, and 8 is substituted with 15, and so forth, so on. The addition is obviously because uh, you look at the state uh, like 10. You find it here. It's uh, 11, so it's 11, but 9 is... 16, so it's a separate instruction again, and so on. And then you reach the end, and uh, now what you want to do is to loop this part around. And for that you need to know, yeah, yes. So, so let me ask a dumb question. Yes. Uh, so 
the bin on the left is the loop header. Yes, so it will become the, now the loop yeah, header, yes. The thing on the right is the loop body, yes, which yes. you're going to execute many, many, many times. Yes. So you've been able to just really quickly generate it. Yes, yes. Right, I see. That's what you want to do, yes. Yes. So essentially, we are doing the loop peeling here for yeah. the, in the, in the, in the sense. And now you want to loop this part around, and for that you need to compute the files, like in a normal system. So you look at the state, you look at some other things, uh, you, you look at the state which you currently have, and you see the difference, and that's kind of the files. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, this is how it looks like. And uh, one interesting thing here, which com is completely mind-bending to the people who work on the normal compilers, is that the files are here and not here. And these things are referencing actually through this. Yeah. Can you explain Phi? Uh, how many people know? Well, people were saying they know what SSA is. So yeah, uh, the Phi is a Greek letter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so the Phi is a, is a Phi. Okay, how do I explain that? Okay, uh, can I use that? Or will we build separately? No, no, no. <laughs> don't don't move. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> that's how you all look to me. So, um, so you have some. Okay, I will explain with in terms of basic blocks and stuff like that. Uh, I will not explain in terms of basic. So this is your loop body, uh, and then obviously you can loop around or you can exit the loop, and then the loop body is entered from somewhere here. So. Here you use some things like variables. Let's, let's explain it simply. Uh, and there are obviously variables that come on this edge and variables that come on this edge, they're different. And uh, you want to encode this somehow that here you refer either to the state from here or state from here, uh, depending on where your control is coming from. And in a single static assignment form or static single assignment form, you, you do this using phi function. This is how the letter is spelled. Uh, so you say Z is a phi of X and Y and that means uh, on this path there is a X floating and uh, flowing and there is Y flowing on this path and here you merge them so because here it was the same in the source code for example it was the variable V variable V and then the state of a variable V here is a phi function of these two so did it become clearer or do I need to draw the This is a phi function in the body. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> uh, better hide it from the camera. Uh, okay. So as you can see in the classical uh, portrayal of the phi function, uh, it was uh, at the top. But here it's a little bit at the bottom. So it's a little bit confusing when you read things. Uh, so it's actually even more confusing because as I was saying, this is piped through the same optimization pipeline as the normal code. So. When you look at this, you suddenly realize that uh, looking at the operands doesn't guarantee you that the operands don't change on the loop iteration because there is no phi in between, uh, actual phi instruction. So when you do the loop stuff, you need somehow to filter out the possibility that you are optimizing through phi's, which would be an incorrect optimization because there is a, if there is a string of length three flowing on one edge and the length of string five flowing on another edge, you cannot do the optimization. So. Uh, so there is actually a small macro you need to put in the right places and if you go through the history of Luajit you discover that this was missing in various places because it's so obscure that it's kind of easy to miss when you're doing an incorrect optimization through the barrier. Uh, okay, that also means that when you do this optimization, this thing here, it actually marks somehow those instructions that would potentially become files uh, that would become non-invariants so that the folding can check for this and abort. Uh, anyway, this is an obscure thing. Uh, there is also thinking of optimization, which I would like to talk about, but I don't want to spend more time than necessary. Yeah, because I have only 28 minutes left. Uh, it's basically you look at the objects that your trace is allocating, and uh, if it's not needed anywhere except side exits, if it does not leak into the fields and stuff like that, uh, then you can decompose it into scalar values and uh, elide the allocation itself. And then when you exit the loop, you would allocate the object. Uh, or if, when you exit the trace. 
Then once your trace is recorded and you created a loop from it, if it was necessary, because not all traces are loops really, uh, then you assemble it using the assembler. Because interpreter is interpreting, assembler is assembling. Uh, optimizer is optimizing. Anyway, uh, the interesting mind-bending thing about assembler is that it's written backwards. So you recorded a trace, and then it turns out that the most natural, the most optimal way to assemble the trace is backwards. So the assembler is written literally backwards. So here you would like to emit the test followed by a jump on the condition of the test. And you write it backwards. So first you emit the jump, and then you emit the test. So this uh, looks very strange when you read the code, and you need to always do like this when you read it, because then it becomes more reasonable. So uh, the register allocation technique used uh, by the uh, assembly, the code generator, is a linear scan. And it's, again, it's a trace, so it's very easy to do linear scan. You, you go backwards, so you see the uses, or last use, before the definition. So you kind of, it's very trivial to do the allocation. It might be hard to do the good allocation, but let's not go into there. It's, uh, it's a whole whole big area. And that's the end, not actually the end. Uh, I just want you to laugh a little bit. No, uh, <laughs> so, uh, let's talk just a little bit about the, how the string things get decomposed into the IR uh, for the examples. So one big uh, problem for all kinds of dynamic languages is doing the loads of the fields from the some dynamic places like table, for example. Here you want to load something from the table. The, like yesterday you heard that the self uses uh, all kinds of uh, things like or the day before that it uses maps to optimize this case. So what Luajit does is that it does just specialize for the place in the dictionary where the uh, value is. So in instead of doing some tracking for how the dictionary evolves during the runtime, it just when it's used it says, okay, load the, si load the size of this hash table and then put a guard checking that it's the same size as we saw before. And then just take the uh, nodes of that hash table, so it's some open addressing hash table. Uh, and then take the uh, node at a fixed position in this array and check if it contains the given constant key. And if it does, okay, we, our probe succeeded and then we can just load and continue. You will also check that the type of the loaded value is a given type. Uh, so. That's it. Basically, you probe in the fixed position in the hash table, and if it, you hit, you are good. If you don't, you are bad. Um, and this works if all your hash tables are created in the same way because the keys end up in the same position. And uh, in assembly code, it looks very efficient. Like, yeah, some assembly code. Uh, you compare the size. Uh, you can see also that the, uh, the code generator is uh, quite good at merging the expressions like for example here you say load sum and compare uh, it's very good at merging the things into the addressing modes of the uh, on the x86 you have the rich addressing mode so you can merge things in them uh, like load this compare the size of hash table load the array uh, load the value of the like the string uh, the pointer to a string compare things together and then just compare that the value contained in the hash table is a number comparing the tag and then just if it's not a number, exit, otherwise continue. Now you have the value loaded. Uh, of course, uh, when you do the object-oriented programming, you have to rely on the loop-invariant code motion to r move all this probing out of your loops because otherwise it's too much. Uh, if you have the code like this, which does, uh, <coughs> which, create, which sets a meta table, like this is how you do object-oriented programming in Lua. You use the meta tables to store the methods. And... Uh, you store the fields on the table itself and the methods are usually stored somewhere on the meta table. And then you use the meta table to look up the methods. Yeah, it's like a prototype based programming. Uh, and if you trace this, you get, so this is the part responsible for doing the method invocation and the field load is somewhere here. So it's a lot of probing. So you need to probe that the, uh, there is no value like that in the dictionary right now if you're, because you're loading something from the prototype essentially. Then you need to load the meta table and probe it for the index part. Then you need to uh, probe it, the meta table itself for the, uh, for the get field methods to check that it's the same method that we executed when we saw the trace before. And it's a lot. 
So you can see by judging by numbers here that this is all in the invariant part of the loop because there is nothing interfering. But if there is some interference, then of course you will be probing again and again, and this is just a lot of code. Uh, so another interesting thing about the trace is that there is no tree entrance. So if you have, you either trace the Lua stuff completely or not. So if you have the call somewhere which can call Lua, this is not possible. So you have to stay inside the trace or you have to exit. So if, you, if you're calling something through the a, F, uh, API, so the Lua API can al allows you to define C functions which are exposed to the Lua side. If you're calling something through the API, the trace will abort there in 2.0. In 2.1, it, it will do a thing called stitching with these traces. So, uh, and the reason why it is not re-entered is quite obvious. You don't want, when you return, you don't want to check invariants that you already computed somewhere. And the, if you're calling arbitrary Lua code, then they can invalidate invariants in an arbitrary way. So, uh, here, here's an example. There's, there is a, this is the string substitution function uh, implemented as a C function. So you have this loop doing some string substitution on the string back and forth. It's just a stupid example to show the, the, the things. Uh, and what the, the Lua G generates here is that it traces, 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 traces. Then there is a string substitution function, which is a C function. So it says, okay, end the trace here. Then it does call this function through, like it exits to the interpreter. The interpreter handles calling this C function. Then when the interpreter returns, it starts tracing again. And then until the next string substitution function, then it does the same dance with exiting to the interpreter and uh, doing the C call, returning to the, uh, to the interpreter again, and then tracing again, and then loop around. And these traces are all independent, and then there is no redundancy elimination between them. So there is, there is a small problem here in terms of uh, uh, the fact that you cannot share the string, can't make one big trace out of this. But it's also not possible because this function can do arbitrary things. Well, not this particular, but some other one. So in the, the inefficiency uh, comes from the fact that you transfer the state between the traces using the interpreter state. So you have to serialize all your state, allocate the things that were sunk, for example, and then uh, continue, and then again re-enter the trace, recheck all the assumptions that you were checking, and stuff like that. Uh, yes? That must be built on the assumption that don't call into the C API very often, but that kind of seems unlikely. Yeah, I will touch this uh, at, the, at the very end, yes. Uh, uh, so the built-in library is, uh, you would like to implement it in a ways that does not uh, hit this problem. So uh, there are two ways to do it. Uh, one way is to define the tra how you trace through the built-in library. Like you can manually say, oh, if you reach this uh, uh, function, then you emit this kind of IR uh, by hand. Or you can, uh, uh, you, yeah, you either need to record it manually, or there is a neat trick in the 2.1 where you can write this comment. Like you said, this is the library function for the table.remove. And uh, it's actually very simple to implement it in the Lua itself with some, uh, with some magical macroses. So there is this build script which takes this, parses it, generates bytecode, patches this bytecode with some special bytecodes, and then the trace compiler can just trace through this bytecode and generate the good IR. Uh, and another way to handle it is say, no, please don't use API, use FFI. So FFI is the way that allows you to efficiently bind to the C functions. So you can call C functions directly, but not through this a API thing, where you can call back and forth, and you have to pass, like API is based on passing the stack essentially in, and then you operate with the stack using the functions which like pop the value from the stack, push the value from the stack. It exposes kind of uh, implementation details. FFI you call directly with the, uh, with the C values. Like for example, you can say, it comes with the C parser, built in into Luajit, a very simple C parser, which parses most of the C. Uh, and uh, it can parse all the like, things like type defs of the structs and uh, uh, function declarations. And then you just can say, OK, allocate the struct with this layout, and then fill it with some structs, and then call the function. And that's all done very efficiently. If the tracing compiler sees that, it does very efficient stuff. Uh, and uh, the assumption here is that you cannot re-enter from the C function that you called from the FFI. So actually there is, a, in the documentation, it says explicitly that if you re-enter, you will be punished uh, <laughs> because you can actually re-enter. But uh, there is assertion. So, and another thing that he does with this FFI, you can specify the meta tables on the FFI things, but uh, 
there is an assumption built in that they are frozen and can never be mutated. So this, this is an interesting thing with the meta tables, that you can change them as your program executes. And uh, of course you need to recheck, that means you need to recheck in the traces uh, what's happening. And you have to assume if you see something that can potentially alias your meta table, you need to recheck things. And uh, for the FFI, he says, you cannot do that. You cannot change the meta table once it was assigned to an FFI meta type. And uh, that allows you to generate really tight traces. Like for example, I showed you how the uh, method call works on the uh, table. And this is how the method call works on the uh, FFI C type. Uh, you just make one comparison with uh, some ID which specifies what kind of C type it is. And then if it's comparison holds, then okay, everything is great. Then you just compute the, where the thing is inside your structure. So this is basically an inline, it's the same method here. It just takes the, we're calling the method and it just takes the field with the fixed offset. And uh, you just compute this like pointer to the inside of the object and you just do a load. And that's it, there's no table probing. This is all you need to do. Uh, uh, yeah, side traces, we talked a little bit about them. There is a problem that uh, there is no, uh, there is the, 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 the way you ca carry values between the trace and side traces is not the most uh, efficient. So if you hit the side trace, you, uh, you can carry some stuff, but you can't carry all the stuff in. And uh, when the side trace loops back to the loop, it always rejoins at the very beginning, at the pre-hitter, which means that if you, uh, if you had some, some allocation sunk objects, you will rematerialize and dematerialize them again on the rejoin of the side trace. Uh, yeah, here is also an interesting example about the bounce check elimination and uh, scalar evolution analysis in the Lua JIT. So in some places in the code, you can say, apply the scalar evolution analysis to the some value. Uh, but actually what it does is that it looks, if the loop is this particular loop for i equals uh, one to n essentially, uh, uh, the, using this byte code. So you, if you write this manually into the something that looks almost exactly the same, uh, this will be slower code with some bounce checks inside the loop than this because he relies on the, I mean in the tracing compiler you kind of, if you don't want to do post optimizations you have to rely on the, uh, just looking the information at the start of your tracing process. Okay, and now the summary of the talk because the talk is called what I learned from logic so I have to summarize what I learned actually. Uh, so, elegance of the code is a double-edged sword. So, it, I showed you that there are a lot of places in the code where things are very neatly packed together, and this is really great. This is very elegant. But if you want to change things, you will stumble and fall on your face because there are a lot of hidden assumptions around. And it's just a lot of very tedious work to carefully change things. Uh, and that's why the elegance is both good and bad because you have a optimal things, but maintaining optimal things is not optimal process. Uh, so do not fear the Reaper. And the Reaper is a preprocessor in this case. Uh, and the preprocessor, I don't mean the C++ preprocessor, I just mean some steps with, which you do during the build time to generate auxiliary things, like fold engine generates a hash table, the assembler, uh, the special assembler generates the interpreter, and stuff like that. Or you find this Lua special Lua functions embedded in the comments in your code and you generate them as a bytecode and embed them in the binary. So don't fear this because it actually makes life easier uh, than just trying to come up with the clever C++ uh, template magic to do the same <laughs> things. Uh, do pre-processing, it's simpler, it's uh, better. Another observation is that users don't understand what makes your engine fast. And for example, you will see people all around saying Luajit is an amazing piece of technology which is very fast. And it is true. But then they proceed to use it using the Lua APIs. And the tracing can no longer trace anything in their code. And of course, they, they, they interpret itself as good, but you don't get the full potential of the, of the Luajit. And uh, that's because they don't understand how the thing works. They see it as a black box. And you have to educate people who use your technology. Uh, and maybe do it politely. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then uh, the, the, the another thing that I learned from working in the LuaJIT, uh, of cooperating with people who use LuaJIT, is that uh, people who don't do compilers, they don't understand how tracing works. It's worse. So if you try to explain how method compiler optimizes something, how the tracing compiler optimizes something, 
it is much harder to explain how tracing compiler optimizes something because the traces that are collected usually have very little relation to what is written in the program and unless you have some very simple loops because you can have tail recursion which gets traced and looped around and explaining how this got traced and looped around is not trivial and explaining the whole guards and side exits that rejoin at the loop header and people have their brains uh, blown out uh, if they have no compiler background even if they're good computer scientists and the final note here is that you have to search for the balance as I showed you, there, is the, there are complex optimizations and there are simple optimizations. And somewhere in between there is a balance where you do, you hit 80% of the cases with 20% of the effort. And uh, you, you, you are happy yourself and uh, your users are sometimes also happy. And, uh, and the final note is that you have to bend the reality around you. If you see, see that something is hard to optimize, like API calls, it's not clear how to make them efficient. You just create the FFI, which is considerably more efficient, and it just pers persuade, educate people to use it. And uh, by doing this, you change the rules of the game, and suddenly your compiler is the best compiler in the world. Uh, so bend reality around you, and that's the end of the talk for today.